sorts are the kind of unifying topic that we'll see through the year. But anyway, without getting into all the talks we'll have, welcome. I'm really excited to see you turn out tonight. My name's Greg Podgorski. I'm the Associate Dean in the College of Science, but more important for this event, I have the honor to chair the Science Unwrapped Committee, uh, and it is a great group of colleagues who make these events possible. And again, for those of you who are first timers at Science Unwrapped, Kim, you can't hear? Okay, let me, let me bump it up a bit, okay? It's, it's definitely loud to me, but let's, let's go. Better? Yes. Better, good, thanks. So, where was I on this? Anyway, Science Unwrapped is a set of events that looks to unwrap science, to demystify it, okay? We have general talks, which I think are always interesting, and then we've got a lot of really great activities after the talk, and we have just a lot of volunteers and a lot of volunteers here tonight, and the list is long. I'm not going to read it all, but I think there are about a dozen or more volunteer groups we've got here tonight. So if you're not aware of the hands-on fun science activities after these talks, please be aware and please take advantage of those activities when Dr. Ben Abbott's talk is done. And our first speaker of the New Science Unwrapped series is none other than Dr. Ben Abbott of, I won't say it, BYU University, <laughs> but, but, but Ben actually is, is an Aggie, tried and true. Ben got his undergraduate degree in watershed sciences uh, way back, well, it doesn't seem so far back to me, in, in 2009. Ben went on to get a PhD at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, where he did work in permafrost thawing and feedbacks into the carbon cycle and bad things that this, this very well may cause in the face of climate change. Ben then went on to do a postdoctoral fellow at the French National Science Institute in Rennes, where he worked on nutrient pollution uh, in echohydrology. I may be making a bit of a mess of that, but it gets the idea across. And then Ben also did a postdoctoral stint at Michigan State University where he did work in Arctic uh, eco-hydrology. Uh, so Ben is an ecosystems ecologist. Ben runs a very active lab at BYU. He has about 20 undergraduate students working with him currently, six graduate students, and two postdoctoral fellows. Um, a few interesting items about Ben's personal uh, background. So Ben was born in Nashville, Tennessee, he came to Utah, to Orem, Utah, where he now resides, okay, as a three-year-old. And there's something about Nashville, I, I've come to conclude, Nashville and music, because one of the favorite things Ben likes to do is to make music, and makes music with his family, and I presume, you know, with other people, but Ben is a musician. Ben loves hiking, Ben loves cycling, and in fact, Ben just participated in an two-leg stage of a Salt Lake City to St. George bike race this morning, and he pedaled, I think, two separate 40-mile legs today? Okay. We'll say today. it's that much, yeah. Okay, today before... 200, before 200 come, miles. Yeah, before... Okay, <laughs> all right, before coming up. So Ben really likes cycling. He, he, he's told me that he really loves snow biking up uh, in the far northern latitudes of, of Fairbanks. This is gonna be an unusual talk for us, in a really interesting talk because most of our talks focus solely on the science. Ben's talk will have a foundation of science, but I think you'll see how science is taken beyond the science and moved into society and public policy. And Ben's talk will have as a context Utah Lake and a controversial project to quote unquote restore Utah Lake. And, and where this goes to is a whole bunch of interesting spin-offs, uh, including in a, in a current lawsuit that Ben is involved in. Uh, ben is, uh, is actually in a defamation lawsuit, and Ben has countersued in a little used Utah law to date, an anti-slap lawsuit, and slap means strategic lawsuit against public participation. Uh, but what we're here tonight, okay, 
is science and society and policy. And I think you'll really learn a lot. So, so thanks very much. And Ben. Thank you, Greg. And thanks uh, to all of the Science Unwrapped for the invitation to come and meet with you today. The last time that I was in this room, I was failing a physics class. <laughs> I remember sitting all the, I think that you were my professor. <laughs> oh my gosh, PTSD. Um, I would sit at the back of the room, I never would do my assignment, and then I just would barely squeak by in the, the uh, tests. So, okay, I'm gonna look, address primarily this half of the audience now. <laughs> I want to talk about Utah Lake, of course, but I also want to take a step back and think about where we are as a, as a people, as inhabitants of this planet, this amazing planet. Uh, you know, with the James Webb Telescope, we're learning more about these exoplanets. We've now learned that only 1% of the exoplanets that are in that Goldilocks zone where liquid water can, um, can be present, only 1% of them have a mix of land and water. The others are all water or all land. So showing again how e Earth is even more unique and precious than we thought before. Um, and this is a time, speaking of PTSD, where many of us are experiencing anxiety and isolation and fear and a sense of powerlessness where we don't know, we're, we're learning more and we can see things that matter, but we don't always know what to do. And I find myself in that same position. And so I, I don't have all of the answers, but I have some questions and some observations. Would it be possible to bring the lights down here on the front just a little bit? Uh, in ecology, we have only four laws. And I think that these laws are way better than the physics laws that I was taught in this room. <laughs> Actually, there are connections here. Here are the four laws. This was uh, succinctly summarized by Barry Commoner, who is uh, an ecologist. And he described ecology as the science of survival. Isn't that a cool description of the science? It, you could be talking about an individual you could talk about a population, a species. Or you could talk about a community, all of the, the species interacting with each other. So here are four ecological laws. No equations needed. And what I want you to do is turn to your neighbor or neighbors and try to come up with an example of one of these laws. Even if you've never seen them before, most of them are self-explanatory. So take 30 seconds, try to come up with an example. Take 10 more seconds. Okay, raise your hand if you've got an, an idea. Anybody have an example of one of these laws? Be brave. Yeah. Great, so somebody's gotta pay for the food that you eat. It comes from somewhere, right? It costs something. And sometimes that's a monetary cost. You literally have to pay money. Always, however, even if you're not paying money, it, it's, there's some environmental cost. We are what are called heterotrophs. That means that we can't make our own food from chemical or light energy. We have to eat other things. There's always a, a cost there. Another example. 
Yeah. So great for number two, if you throw away trash, it has to go somewhere. We have that funny phrase, I'm gonna throw something away. Well, where is away? It's a place. And in fact, Barry Commoner would say, there is no away. We need to be thinking about where those objects go. And so those two, everything must go somewhere, and there ain't no such thing as a free lunch, those are actually two sides of conservation of energy and mass, right? Just expressed in the ecological form. What about nature knows best? Did anybody talk about that law? Yeah, what did you come up with? Chernobyl. Wow, awesome example. Just a one word answer too. Do you want to elaborate? So this, um, this disaster, um, the most famous nuclear disaster, and afterwards it was all abandoned, and so you saw this recovery in that area. This law is sometimes called the law of unintended consequences, where we see something in nature that we think we can improve. Ah, wouldn't it be great if I had some more muscles? <laughs> that would be. My little, I, I rode the bike race with my little brother, and he looks like Captain America after taking the serum, and I look like him before taking the serum, right? <laughs> But if I tried to, if I put chemicals in my body to change the, the shape of my body, there'd be lots of unintended consequences for that, right? So nature knows best. There's a reason why things are the way that they are. And then the Chernobyl example is another great idea of everything is connected. So as we talk about things tonight, and I hope as you go home, you remember these laws because they also apply to our personal lives as we're deciding how we spend our time and who we spend our time with. So uh, another non-rhetorical question. What do you think the most important environmental issues are? With your neighbor, decide on at least two. <laughs> Take a minute. OK, are you not hearing it? working before I think I just turned it I just turned it okay let's try it and then it's okay That's great. okay take 10 more seconds come up with at least two All right. Anyone willing to share? Yeah. Ocean acidification. Who else had that one on their list? It was on one of your two? OK, several hands go up. Such an important issue. That's sometimes called the other CO2 problem, right? Even if we did some crazy geoengineering thing to shade out the sun with space mirrors or aerosols, first of all, remember our law of nature knows best. But even if we were to do that, there still would be CO2 in the atmosphere. Did I see another hand? Yeah. Dying bees. Dying bees and insects actually worldwide. It's not only domestic bees, but we're seeing declines in insects. Anybody else have that one on there? Decrease of biodiversity or something like that? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Droughts. Droughts. So important. We all need water, right? And many cultures say water is life. Yeah. Garbage, we're creating all this garbage. Some of it can last for hundreds or thousands of years, a huge issue, yeah. Oh, uh, overfishing, so most fisheries throughout the whole world have experienced collapses where we've overfished them. Oftentimes that happens after we damage the habitat. So it's not only that we're taking too many fish, but we're decreasing their ability to reproduce. Thank you. A final one? Yeah. Air pollution. Such an important issue. 99% uh, of the world's population lives in an area that's breathing unhealthy air, according toward the, the World Health Organization standards. 
It's affecting everyone on Earth. Yeah? Global warming. Global warming. Such an, an, a crucial issue. Did you know that carbon dioxide is our primary product as a species? If you take all of the other things that we produce, all of the cement, steel, wheat, corn, and add it together, we make more carbon dioxide than all of that. 40 billion tons every year. So for each one of us, here in the United States, we average around 13 tons each. Think about if we were creating 13 tons of visible garbage, each one of us. Well, we are creating 13 tons of pollution, but it's invisible. And so it's easy to think it's not having an effect. Thank you very much. Now, I'm grateful for the diversity here and thinking about different issues. I'm just going to tell you what I think the four most important environmental issues are. This is not the, uh, a perfect list, but here's what I really am concerned about. Harm to human health from environmental pollution, number one. A decline of life on Earth, whether that's fish or bees or anything. The gl uh, global intensification of biogeochemical cycles. Doesn't that one sound boring? <laughs> and then number four, climate change. And I care about number three and number four because of how they're influencing well-being of people and well-being of other life. Right? Venus has experienced climate change in its history. I'm not as concerned about that. There aren't people. There's not life there that we know of yet. But I'm extremely concerned about nutrient pollution and climate change here on Earth because this is our home. And you may have heard uh, arguments about, are we going to have the economy do really great or are we going to take care of the environment? It's an either or. And I see that as exactly upside down and backwards. This is a, a figure that one of my uh, graduate students put together, showing causes of death. Every year, there are about 60 million deaths in the, in the world. A quarter of them are being caused by environmental pollution, primarily air pollution, but secondarily water and soil pollution. So when I wake up in the morning, I am concerned about a lot of things. Am I going to fall off my bike and scrape my knee? <laughs> am I going to be to a meeting on time? I'm even fearful of some things, right? But pollution isn't there at the front of my mind the way that it needs to be. We all need to be thinking about these issues. Not because we're saving the Earth. The Earth is going to be fine. It's been through a lot. We need to be thinking about these things to save us. That's a term uh, Catherine Hayhoe, one of my role models, has an amazing book called Saving Us that I encourage all of you to look at. So here's one view. It's the economy, it's the environment, it's society that are all competing together. But I like this ecological view much better. All of society exists within the Earth system, and all of the economy, that's only a portion of the things that we care about in society. OK, so now let's talk about Utah Lake. This is a picture of the lake taken by Jeff Beck, um, just a local citizen who really likes getting up early and staying up late and taking pictures. Utah Lake is the largest freshwater lake in Utah, 150 square miles. It is the centerpiece of Utah Valley and has been for millennia. And it has been described as having hemispheric importance. What's a hemisphere? Good science term. Anybody know? You can only answer if you are not 20 years old. Yeah, what's a hemisphere? A division of the Earth, a half of the Earth. And you can do west, east, north, south. I, maybe you can do hemispheres that are tilted. I've never heard of that. It's of hemispheric importance because it is an island of water in the vast sea of the Great Basin, which is 99% land. And so if you are a fish or a microorganism or a migratory bird, you need to stop over at a place like Utah Lake or the wetlands of the Great Salt Lake. It is an extremely resilient ecosystem. It's naturally cloudy, and that protects the lake from algal blooms. It's naturally shallow, so that when there are algal blooms, instead of creating a dead zone, 
So you might have heard in the Gulf of Mexico or in some of these large deep lakes, you can have a hypoxic dead zone that forms, that kills all the fish. That never happens in Utah Lake because it's only an average of nine feet deep. And I don't know if any, has anybody visited Utah Lake? Raise your hand if you have, or at least driven by it. You can jump off of a boat into Utah Lake in the middle and touch the bottom and then raise your hand up and still get above the water. It's, it's, in many ways, it's like a large wetland. This increases the resilience of the lake. The evaporation and the lake bed are constantly removing pollutants that's helping the lake, even though it has a lot of people that live in its watershed, the area that drains the lake. And there is a population that's rediscovering and reconnecting with the lake. Here are just some pretty pictures. On the left is a, gr a graph that's showing the connections to different areas. These are birds that were tagged in the Great Salt Lake and Utah Lake system that then were observed in other places, countries all over North and South America. And some of the occupants of Utah Lake, some of the human occupants of Utah Lake. Lots of cool, fun things to do there. Um, if you want to see more pictures, join them on social media, the Utah Lake Photography Club. You don't have to live there. Uh, every day there are tens and hundreds of photos that are shared. It is beautiful in every season and from every angle. Really encourage you to go visit this extraordinary water body. Um, in the wintertime, you get these uh, ice that piles up because it's a freshwater lake with this huge fetch. That means the area of the lake that the wind can then push across and build these mountains of ice that are really fun to crawl on. But it also is vulnerable. It has a huge watershed, 3,000 square miles. It's in a semi-arid climate, so we talked about drought early on, right? We grow a lot of food in Utah, and we have to irrigate. In some places, the food grows without having to irrigate but we're diverting water from Utah Lake the same way that we are from the Great Salt Lake. And indeed, they're connected. Utah Lake provides um, over 20% of the flow to the Great Salt Lake. So remember that ecological law, everything is connected to everything else. Now, it's a remnant of Lake Bonneville, just like the Great Salt Lake is. So where we are today, Utah State University is on a delta of Lake Bonneville. And people have been living around and depending on and taking care of Utah Lake for a long, long time. In fact, even before Utah Lake became Utah Lake, when it was still part of Lake Bonneville, we now know that there were uh, native indigenous peoples that lived in that area. Now, it's interesting because those tribal groups, the Timpanogos and Ute and Paiute, had told people like me, I'm a newcomer. Right? My family has only lived in this area for a couple hundred years. And they had been telling historians and archaeologists and scientists that they had been here for uh, a long, long time, much longer than the few thousand years. And we now have evidence. Science is finally catching up to that traditional ecological knowledge, knowing that, sure enough, people have lived there. Now, things changed a lot. I'm going to just skip through this for the sake of time. This is uh, Mary Murdoch Meyer, the current chief executive of the Timpanogos Nation, who's deeply involved in Utah Lake um, conservation. Unfortunately, uh, Shortly after the Mormon settlers arrived, there was a breakdown uh, in the relationship between the newcomers and those who knew the most about the lake. And through a series of tragic and violent conflicts, eventually the Timpanogos Nation and other tribal groups were pushed out of the valley and sent away to the Uinta Reservation that had been created by President Abraham Lincoln just a few years before in anticipation of the displacement of those people. Isn't that, a, isn't that a, 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 just a really sobering story? They prepared the reservation before, even when they still had um, contractual agreements to not displace the people. Right? An example of how when we mistreat one another, that also harms the environment because we lost all of the understanding about the natural cycles of the lake. One of, now the, the lake saved the early Mormon settlers. And there were crop failures in uh, 1853 and 1854, just a few years after arriving there. And fish from the lake, the June sucker, it's called the June sucker because in June it migrates up the, the rivers and reproduces. The same way that you might have heard of salmon doing that from the ocean to the river. 
And the settlers were able to put out these boxes and the fish were a food source that then was transported all throughout the Utah Territory at the time. So the seagull, the California seagull is our state bird. But I think that the June sucker should be our state fish. Um, through time, the lake system changed. And in the 20th century, so in the 1900s, there was a loss of many of the native fish. And there was a transition from emergent vegetation to primarily being dominated by algae. That happened in the 1960s and 70s. This was also happening all throughout the United States and the world. In fact, today, two thirds of freshwater bodies are affected by this nutrient overload. Remember that weird thing that I'm worried about, biogeochemical cycles? Everything that we do puts fertilizer into the environment. Is there anyone here who has gone to the bathroom today? Raise your hand. If anybody hasn't ra raised their hand, then come talk to me. I'm not a medical doctor, but we need to get some help. We all go to the bathroom, right? Each time we do, we're flushing a little bit of nutrient downstream. That doesn't disappear, even though it gets sucked up by the toilet. It ends up in our river, streams, and groundwater. Thankfully, we remove the solids and the pathogens, but the nutrients are still there. And then this fish, the June sucker, went from being so abundant that Utah, Utah Lake was called the world's largest sucker pond when it was first described by fishery scientists to there only being 300 in the 1990s. And it was, the population was collapsing so quickly that they decided to collect all of the June sucker and put them in um, a controlled facility where they could help them reproduce. They're a fish that can live for a long period of time, 30 or 40 years, and they reproduce relatively slowly. So vulnerable to overfishing. And the listing of the June sucker started a comprehensive program to restore Utah Lake. Here are just some of the partners that are working together to restore the Utah Lake ecosystem. Uh, I'm gonna highlight one of them over here. The carp removal, so when the, when the June sucker population collapsed, we introduced carp to the lake. This is actually part of a federal program. Lakes all over the United States, we introduced carp as a food source, and the carp did very well. But there was a cultural disconnect. The people didn't know how to cook the carp. They didn't want to. It was a warm water fish, not the cold water fish they were used to, and it became invasive. Well, there have been 123 blue whales worth of carp that have been removed from Utah Lake. Isn't that amazing? Imagine a blue whale, right? A, an organism long enough to go across this whole auditorium here. And 123 of those, that much mass of carp has been removed. These efforts have had an amazing effect on the lake. They have restored habitat. The June sucker recovered from 300 to 50,000 observed this year in June. An amazing, isn't that, yes, let's applaud for the, the June sucker. And, and the people, right, who realized there were lots of people who asked, why are we caring about this fish? It's called a sucker, right? It's not a, not a very uh, happy name. But because of that, we also are seeing the recovery of native vegetation. More birds are coming to the lake. People are visiting the lake. Uh, water flow to the lake has increased because of that program. The Great Salt Lake would be even lower if not for the water rights that were granted for con conservation of the June sucker. Algal bloom intensity, extent, and frequency are decreasing for the lake as a whole. And the public is becoming more aware of the lake. I put a thumbs up, but there still are some major misconceptions about Utah Lake. So here's the graph showing the June sucker recovering. Here's a recent satellite study showing the decline in algal blooms in the lake. But then in 2018, this happened. There was a proposal to take, this is just a, a rendering of Utah Lake. And this group wanted to build the world's largest artificial islands, a whole archipelago, 20,000 acres of artificial land in this precious island of water and crisscross the lake with highways. They wanted to deepen the lake. They said they were going to make the lake clear. Well, remember what makes Utah Lake 
resilient. All of those things. This, is, this group was called Lake Restoration Solutions. This is one of their early drawings. They wanted to make the islands in shapes that were inspired by Arches National Park, which to me and, and many others, even those without a scientific background, it seemed so crazy that you were going to deface one of the natural wonders of this region with the image of another one of its natural wonders. Right? Really, really backwards. And so I and many others assumed this, this wouldn't go anywhere. But then they convinced the legislature in 2018 to pass a law that allowed the state to give away the sovereign lands that are supposed to be held in permanent trust for the people of Utah, present and future, for a promise of restoring the lake. And we thought that this idea was just too crazy, that it was going to die, right? that it would just uh, fizzle out. And so many of us didn't pay attention. Or many of us were employed, this is us, the royal we, many of us were employed by the state. And we couldn't speak out because the governor's office and the whole Utah congressional delegation, all of our senators and congresspeople had signed letters of support for the project. They applied to the EPA for almost a billion dollars of subsidized loans to get this project going. It was going to take 40 years. They were going to dredge a billion cubic yards of sediment. 95% of the lake bed was going to be destroyed and dredged into these islands. And again, here are the, those factors. Nature knows best, right? There's a reason why the lake is as it is. We should be trying to restore it back to a natural state, not tra radically transforming it into something new. They were going to change all of these things. And last year, we found out that the governor's office was just hours away from announcing a public-private partnership with Lake Restoration Solutions. They had become convinced that this was the best thing for Utah Lake. And I and many uh, everyday citizens, stay-at-home parents and volunteer researchers and engineers and lawyers, uh, children, lots of kids got involved. But I felt like this, this, whole, this project was there. It was going to come crashing down on us. There was no way we were going to stop it. They claimed to have $6.5 billion of, of funding. Has anyone here made $6.5 billion? <laughs> I sure hadn't. Well, we started to research the lake. We found out this was not the first time that a crazy thing had been proposed. In the 1970s, the federal government wanted to drill for oil under Utah Lake during the oil crisis. But guess what? Everyday people joined together and said no. They convinced their legislators that this wasn't a good thing, that it was risky, that it was going to be unsightly. They had all kinds of different reasons for opposing it. And they took this all the way to the Supreme Court. And the lake won. And not just the lake, the people and the lake working together. We found out that in the 1980s, a very similar project was going to cut off and dry out two of the main sections of the lake that people thought were worthless and build a giant island. This is called the Utah Lake Authority. It also was shot down when the people came together. We started to have hope. We started to think if we work together, we might be able to stop this. So a group of 120 of us, researchers, many of you here today, signed on to a letter of warning saying, we're concerned about this project. Where is the evidence showing that this is a good idea? Why are taxpayer dollars being used for this? Coming from different perspectives. And kind of as naive researchers and engineers, we thought this would solve everything. Well, it didn't on its own, but it was the beginning people working together. Cities started to listen around the community. We had a rally where 600 people came together. And it was at an awkward time, like a Tuesday afternoon, including many children. And we had uh, uh, partners in the legislature who agreed to run uh, legislation to make sure that this transfer of land was economically sound and constitutional. The cities passed resolutions saying they didn't want this to happen. And then just a few weeks ago, Jamie Barnes, the director of Forestry, Fire, and State Lands, announced publicly that the project was 
un legally unsound and unconstitutional. Now, it's not formally stopped, but we believe that that's going to happen in the next few weeks or months. And what I want you to, again, take a, take a minute and think about when you are facing these big, scary environmental issues, important issues that are going to affect us and those that come later, our own descendants and the other creatures that we share this earth with. What are the communities that, we can, that we're a part of, that we can draw on? And then also think about who are the people that have supported us and gotten us here? And do this, one, do this one privately. Think about who has supported you when you've been scared, when you're facing that boulder, you don't know what to do. It might be a parent. It might be a, a friend. It might be a teacher, even a scary physics teacher. <laughs> Just take 10 seconds and think about who has helped you. What groups are you a part of? You are not alone. And in fact, you might be the only person in that group. Maybe it's a fishing group. Maybe it's a boating group. Maybe it's a reading group. Maybe it's just a group of friends. You might be the only one that knows about that issue. And if you talk about it with the people in that group, that is going to magnify. That's going to allow everything to become connected in a good way. And we can start to solve these issues. Because this is not the reality. This is closer to the reality. There are so many people that are engaged and concerned and working to solve these issues. There are tens of millions of people and even billions of people working to solve pollution and climate change, to protect the habitat in the place that they live. And so my final question, ah, I just, sorry, I had, couldn't have, a, not have a diagram. So this is the diagram that I've come to think about. You learn about a problem, this makes you care about the issue. Now, it can lead in two ways. You can either get discouraged about it, and I've been, I've been discouraged about a lot of issues and given up. I remember as a kid, when I was about your age, I heard about the Grevy zebra, a subspecies of plain zebra that was threatened in Africa. And I literally remember going to bed at night and crying about the zebra that was going extinct. But I didn't do anything. Right? I didn't know who to learn from. I didn't know who, what to do. But if we have hope, and if we have faith that what we do can make a difference, then this can lead to organizing and connecting and acting. But it's not just a cycle that feeds on itself. It's a, it's a web. Because as you talk to people, you learn more. As you organize, you start to have more hope and faith. You start believing that even though we, you know, my total, my total assets are in the tens of thousands, not the billions, but we can go up because truth is on our side, because we're building community. And so I encourage all of you to not get discouraged, not go down that path of despair. And so let's finish by asking ourselves, what is keeping us from acting? Why, what are the reasons? And this isn't accusatory. All of us don't act on things that we care about. I, when I talked to Greg earlier this week, I had just eaten a, a donut and had soda for my lunch, which was super delicious. But I knew that probably wasn't the best thing for my body, right? We all make choices that aren't always the best. But what are the reasons that we're not doing more to solve these environmental issues? And that's what I hope we can have a conversation about now. Or, and I'd also be happy to take any, any questions that you have. Thank you very much. So please ask Dr. Abbott any questions you've got. And uh, what we're going to do, too, is I've got some of my favorite College of Science ambassadors. These are two microphones, believe it or not. So our ambassadors will run someplace in your area and then toss the mic over. So questions? Yes, here you go. You can speak into the box. Right. Hello. 
Okay. <laughs> Uh, I've heard that there was once a great population of cutthroat trout in the lake. Can you give any more information regarding that, both historically and currently? Yeah, so cut, um, <clears throat> Bonneville cutthroat trout are one of the original native species in the lake. They require cold water habitat, so it's likely they used the lake during the snowmelt period to access all of the interconnected rivers. So one of the issues we're facing now is many of the rivers have been dammed and diverted. And so fish can't access all of the habitat that they could. And one thing we could do is reestablish that passability mm -hmm. if we want to bring back the cut, cutthroat trout in that system. Okay. A great question. I love throwing this, so, so please, questions. Let's see, we're okay, good. Ready? Are you a good catch? Okay, let's see how good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what is the best way we can use science to foster a healthier world? Oh, great question. You know, science, science is necessary, but it's not sufficient to solve these problems. Right? We know exactly what's causing climate change. It's human production of greenhouse gases, primarily from use of fossil fuels. So we have to go beyond just knowing the thing, and I think that the most important action that we can take is talking to people about these issues, sharing our values. You know, I, I come from a particular background, a particular race, and I have certain hobbies, and I'm a member of a certain religion. I might connect to people in that group, but we need each one of you to be talking to the people that, re that are going to listen to you, and they're going to find you uh, convincing. So talk about the science, of course, but also talk about why you care about it, um, because we all have shared values. I think that you're going to be hard pressed to find somebody who says, I don't want to leave a better world for the people that come after me. There's a wonderful phrase. You can ask yourself, am I being a good ancestor? That's kind of a weird way to ask it. But am I being an ancestor when a few generations from now people look back? They may not know my name. In fact, that's great. But will they have be grateful for the things that, that we did together? Are we leaving a better world? It's an awesome, awesome question. Other questions? There's a question from our home audience, Ben, and, and this is live stream, and it's one thing I've forgotten in the introduction. But the question was about all the rubbish. Where does it go? Yeah, uh, related to Utah Lake in pr specifically? The, the question, just rubbish in general, but we can relate it to Utah Lake or, or generally. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to start in a kind of different place. We want to move toward a circular economy. And in a truly circular economy, we're mimicking nature. Because in nature, nothing is wasted. Right? Even a, a little pile of poo is an amazing resource for many organisms. Right? Every, everything that comes out is a useful thing for the cycle to move around. So we want to transition to a world where we're building things in the same way that nothing is wasted, but we're not there right now. And so there is an issue globally where certain things are accumulated in, in landfills. Uh, unfortunately, in many areas, there's not solid waste management. And so you see huge amounts of plastics that are moving through uh, freshwater and marine ecosystems. And those plastics are coming from interesting places. Anybody want to take a guess? What are the two biggest sources of plastics that we observe in water. Yeah? Plastic bags are one that we see all the time, but they're actually not one of the main sources, right? They're big enough to see, yeah. Plastic bottles, also big enough to see, but not, a, not the main source. Those are really important, and we need to reduce the use of them, yeah. Clothing. Most of our clothing is made up partially of plastic. And it's constantly breaking down and shedding things into the environment. Uh, and those wash around. The other one is tires. Isn't that interesting? So again, you start to see everything is connected. And when you make these small changes in your life, if you start to walk or ride a bicycle or use transit to get around, it has all these positive ripples that move out through the system. OK, any other questions? Um, how can the nutrient pollution heading into Utah Lake be reduced? 
Awesome question. About 80% of the nutrients going into Utah Lake are coming from the wastewater treatment plants. And so again, that's all of us flushing the toilet uh, uh, every day. We can treat the water to remove those nutrients. And in fact, right now there are plans to upgrade those wastewater treatment plants. Um, we see a decrease in the algal blooms, but it wasn't a gradual decrease. It was kind of a step change, right? They were up here happening a lot, and then all of a sudden they were happening less. We think that happened from the early implementation of the wastewater treatment plants. We now need to have another step where it, there's even uh, fewer, less nutrient going in there. Along with, yeah, stormwater management and other things. All right. So has the lake level of Utah Lake like visibly decreased in the past decade, century, whatever? Yeah, awesome question. With Great Salt Lake, if we look through time, since the 1980s when we had those couple of big flooding years, it's been doing this, right? Down, down, down. Utah Lake's level has been doing this. Up and down and up and down. It, Utah Lake was Utah's first artificial reservoir. So uh, the early settlers built a flow control device at the Jordan River. And so they let it fill up really high in the springtime to store water, and then they drain it down really low in the fall. Because of that, because there's so many people demanding the fresh water downstream, it hasn't seen this big decline. But it, actually, this year, it's extremely low because of the same issues. We're using too much water upstream. About 80% of that is agricultural water, mainly used to grow alfalfa. And there are great researchers here at Utah State who are figuring out ways that we still can grow food locally, but use a lot less water. So there's enough for nature as well. OK, we'll have time for one more question. OK, thanks, Jan. I'm going I'm to get closer to this one because you're in a close group here. OK, so you said how like the Utah Lake um, is like, a big part of just our, you know, help, like helps our ecosystem in general. Yeah. If we were to help, like if we were to preserve the Utah Lake a lot, how would it affect um, other parts of our ecosystem? Yeah. And how would that help uh, preserve like other contributing factors? Yeah, thank you for that insightful question. Um, I think the, the most impactful thing we could do for Utah Lake is to restore its hydrology. So if we were to allow the snow melt to flow into the lake, to fill the lake early in the year, that's gonna restore a lot of the fish habitat. It's going to help the plants that are growing all around the lake to reestablish. Currently, it's really difficult when you have this artificially high and then artificially low water level. And what else would that water do? Can anybody think of another issue that this might help with? Birds are gonna be great, but the Great Salt Lake is drying out. And we could allow that water to flow through the Jordan River, helping the Jordan River corridor and helping uh, refill the Great Salt Lake. So if we can live within our means, right, rather than trying to adapt the environment to our whims, and let's build another pipeline, right? Have you heard this proposal to build a pipeline from the Pacific? <laughs> I heard uh, a very knowledgeable um, person get asked about that publicly. And he said, that's, a, that's like asking me, how many leprechauns does it take to saddle a unicorn? <laughs> right? like that is not a solution. It's going to create way more problems. It's also not tractable. If you do the simple physics calculation of how much energy it would take to raise 100 million acre feet of water to refill the Great Salt Lake, that it would take more energy than everything we're doing in Utah currently all of the transportation, all of the electricity production, and everything. It's just not a solution. Instead, we need to be looking at how can we change? How can we live in harmony with this area? That's going to make us happier. It's going to make us more resilient to, to future changes and able to really make progress. OK, I want to thank Dr. Abbott for an excellent talk. Thank you, Ron. Thanks, Dr. Thank you, everyone. Before you go, I want to put in a pitch for our next Science Unwrap talk, and we have the speaker in the audience, Dr. Kim Hageman. Kim, can you stand up? Kim, where's Kim? There's Kim. Okay. 
And Dr. Hageman will be speaking on chemical commuters. And it's, it's a related talk, actually, to Dr. Abbott's. It's the long distance movement of chemicals through the environment with most of these chemicals actually being human produced. And that talk will be on October 21st, Friday. I hope to see you there. So thanks for coming out. Please take advantage of the science activities. Have lots of fun. So thank you again and have a good night. Yeah.